Christ is risen. <clears throat> Let's try that again. We can do a little bit better, friends. Christ is risen. Welcome, welcome everyone to this very special Easter Sunday. My name is Reverend Colin Knapp. I am the senior pastor of this beloved community. Um, if you're visiting with us today, a very special welcome to you. I know it takes a lot of courage to be in a new place uh, where you don't know a lot of people. So good on you for being here this morning. My hope is that no matter where your faith is at this morning, no matter uh, what it is, in fact, you believe or, or don't believe, my hope is that you feel safe this morning in this place to experience the profound presence and love of God that is uniquely for you and, and that you receive it as peace but also as a challenge. And you'll notice um, that many of us are wearing a special ribbon today. We are honoring a Transgender Day of Visibility, which is today, March 31st as well. If you want to know what kind of church Pilgrim is, it's a place where we celebrate diversity. Um, and you'll see in your bulletin a fuller explanation of the Transgender Day of Visibility. But let me just read this sentence that seems so poignant to who we are as a people of faith. We affirm the inherent dignity and worth of all individuals we embrace diversity. We stand in solidarity with our transgender siblings. And so we, as a community, as a beloved community, want to build a world for the flourishing of all. And we do that because we believe something mysterious, profound, beautiful happened on this Easter morning some 2,000 years ago. So let us do what we came to do. Let us worship God.
Happy Easter. Happy Easter. My name is Jenny Burney, and it is my privilege to be your liturgist today. If you could please stand as you're able and join me in our uh, call to worship, followed by the opening hymn and the opening prayer. This is the day when, when tears are wiped away, away, shattered hearts are mended, fears are replaced with joy. This is the day the Lord rolls away the stone of fear, throws off death's clothes, goes ahead of us into God's future. This is the day the Lord has made. Death has no cure for us. Sin has lost its power over us. God opens the tombs of our hearts to fill us with life. This is the day, Easter day. Christ is risen, hallelujah. And please remain standing for our opening hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Very early on that first day, you caught chaos unawares, astounding God. Planting grace in a garden, setting love loose on creation, flinging joy into the air. Very early on that first day, Jesus, son of justice, you staggered sin, throwing its weight off the world. You confounded death, leaving it alone in the grave. You opened the gates of the kingdom so all could follow you into life. 
very early on this first day of the week while we were washing sleep from our eyes and trying to make sense of our lives, you sang glad songs to us. Scarred spirit, rolling away fears from our hearts so we can see the risen Lord, God in community, holy in one, very early on this first day of the week, as we do on every day of our lives, we lift our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite Sammy and Lucy to come forward, and Bobby, our chair of deacons, and Sandy Swanson, our moderator. Friends, we are received into the church through a gracious welcome. Come on over here. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hear these words from scripture. You are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are equally citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus alone being cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in God in whom you are also built for it be the dwelling place of God and the Holy Spirit. And so at this time we are ready to receive Sammy and Lucy as they join us as Pilgrim Congregational Church's newest members. And so I ask you some questions. Some very simple questions. Do you affirm your baptism into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I do. I do. And do you renounce the powers of evil and desire the freedom of new life in Christ? I do. And, and do you profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? I do. And do you promise, by the grace of God, to be Christ's disciple? to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best as you are able. I promise with the help of God. Amen. And do you promise, according to the grace given you, to grow in the Christian faith, to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering Christ's mission in all the world. I do with the help of God. And lastly, the last one I promise. <laughs> do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God and enlisting in the work of this local church as it serves our community and our world? I do with the help of God. Amen. Please, please stand as you are able so that we can welcome Lucy and Sammy. Let us, the members of Pilgrim Congregational United Church of Christ, express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry in Christ. We welcome you with joy as partners in the common life of this church. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and labors of the Church of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we continue to grow together in God's knowledge and love and be witnesses of our risen Savior. In the name of Jesus Christ, and on behalf of Pilgrim Congregational United Church of Christ, I extend to you the hand of Christian love, welcoming you into the company of this local church. Welcome. Welcome. Let's pray. Oh God, we praise you for calling us to faith and for gathering us into the church, the body of Christ. We thank you for your people gathered in this local church and rejoice that you have increased our community of faith. Together, may we live in the spirit, building one another up in love, 
sharing in the life and worship of the church, and serving the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now sing our response. Please be seated. A Psalm, the 118th number, verses 1 through 2, and then 14 through 24. If you could, please read along with me silently um, as I read the NRSV version as printed in our bulletin. Oh God, let's do that again. <laughs> oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The word of the Lord for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I call the youth of the congregation forward. Good morning, good morning. Here, Josh, we're going to sit over here. Let's make room for Peter. Let's make room for Everett. Here, we could scooch a little bit more. Perfect. Perfect. Well, what are we celebrating today? Oh, I think we are celebrating Easter. In this basket here, I have the story, the love story of Easter that I'm going to share with you with a few items that are in here, okay? So there once, so there once was a man who loved so big that he changed the world. Now, anyone who met this man knew that God was in him and he was in God. And when anyone ever met them, him, and they would ask him, and what's this man's name? Jesus. Jesus. Whenever they met Jesus, they asked him 
how should I live my life? And Jesus would say, love God, love yourself, and love everyone else. So, there was some people, that's right, just, just leave them. There was some people who didn't like this idea. They didn't like the idea of loving God, loving yourself, and loving others. And you know why? Because they thought it was too hard and they didn't want to learn a hard thing. So they decided that they were going to have Jesus killed. So now this was the sad part of the story. So, no questions, yeah. But thank you. They decided they were going to have Jesus killed. So they took Jesus and they put him on a cross. Which, when we look at the cross and hear that part of the story, we think it's a sad thing. But just wait, because the story's not over. Now, can you imagine you're the friends of Jesus and you find out that your friend is, is dead? It broke their heart. Their hearts were broken and they got together like you would if you were sad and they loved each other and they hugged and they shared and they felt a little bit better and their hearts started to mend a little bit because they were sharing with each other. So now they took Jesus' body and they put it in a tomb. Who knows what a tomb is? What's a tomb? Tell me. A big cave. They put him in there and they roll a stone, a big, imagine this, way bigger, a big stone in front of it. Now, a couple days later, three of Jesus' friends who loved him very, very much went to this tomb where the stone was, and this is the mysterious part. The stone was rolled away, and inside there, there was someone dressed all in white, and they said, do not be afraid. You think it was an angel? No, Maybe. Michael, okay, come have a seat Michael. right here. Have a seat angel. right here. There was an oh, angel, Michael. we're going to say an angel for sure, okay? And they said, do not be afraid because this is the good news. This is the good news. Jesus is alive. So when I hear that, it changes the cross from a sad thing to a happy thing because it reminds me they are, uh, there, okay, no, no. It reminds me that God is with me always in the hard times, in any times when I'm struggling, God is with me. Here, sit right here, sweetie. Sit down right here. It's with me. And it gives me courage to do that hard thing that those people were afraid to do, to Love God, love yourself, and love others. We're going to close with a singing hymn to a, a, um, Amen today to a familiar song that I think we're all going to do that you'll all know, the Alleluia, <laughs> praise ye the Lord. Like from the middle here over, you're all going to be um, Alleluia. You're all going to be praise the Lord. So when your part comes, you're going to raise your hands like this. Let's practice Alleluia. Alleluia. Praise you the Lord. Okay, here we go. Your praise, your alleluia. You ready? Here we go. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Praise ye the Lord. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Praise ye the Lord. Get ready. Praise ye the Lord. Alleluia. Praise ye the Lord. Alleluia. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah! Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Okay, let's go. Well, Matthew, are you staying with that? Oh, they could use it. No, 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 no. There's no connect. Our gospel There's no connect. There's no connect. No. Our no, gospel reading on. today You're going downstairs. There's comes no from John 20, come on, come on, 1 no through connect. 18. You're going downstairs. It is printed inside the bulletin. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still yeah. dark, 
Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not touch me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is a lot of spirit in the sanctuary this morning, is there not? (laughs) Friends, what hope do we proclaim on this resurrection day? For those special visitors with us this morning, allow me to begin with a brief public service announcement. I am not a preacher trying to sell you snake oil or a spiritual umbrella policy. We don't have Bibles for sale for (laughs) $59.99. I don't have a magical prayer that you can say to keep you from the gates of hell. I offer you no guarantees of financial windfalls, sudden weight loss, thickening hair, or increased libido. Your attendance here does not particularly earn God's favor or any sort of material blessing based off your sincerely held beliefs. Be warned, my friends, there is no hope in such things. Do not trust in them. Our contemporary secular versions of hope tend to focus on continued human development normally through technological advancement. They promise a hope that our lives on this earth will in some way go on forever, that we will escape death through biotechnological achievement, or maybe it is just the hope that we live in a state of perpetual progress each day and week month and year, getting just slightly, incrementally better than the last, or perhaps the last hope that our society offers us is that somehow, after all of our striving and yearning, we might make 
meaning out of our lives that will last beyond our deaths? Are these the hopes that are rooted in resurrection? No, all these things are too little to hope in truly. And too many Easter sermons sound like a half to a halftime locker room pep talk than the radical gospel of Easter. Life may be hard, the preacher will say. We may be down, but it's only halftime. Remember, Jesus was down too. He had his cross to bear, but he was rewarded by the triumph of Easter. This is the gospel of prosperity, not the gospel of death and resurrection. You know the taglines. Your best life now. Make every day Friday. Be the best person you can be. What these sermons tragically overlook is that Easter is not merely a way to get along better in this world as it is, but is instead the end of this world. Easter destroys the perceived world at hand, and before we can truly sing about the joys of Easter's new reality, the hope we truly have in a future, it's crucial to recognize the sorrow and surprise of it all, the way in which Easter destroys our old reality, and we stand in that rubble. Easter demands that we let go of the assumed and assured world. It calls for nothing less than a change of citizenship. And when you really start to take that seriously, you realize how frightening that demand is. The more astounding than can be imagined invitation of Easter is to leave the familiar but dying world behind and enter a new but also unexpected and uncertain world in the resurrection. We have reasons to weep and to mourn and be a bit afraid. You'll notice in the text there is both fear and joy in our scripture reading. And that's precisely what catches my attention this year from the Gospel of John. Mary, Mary is weeping. <laughs> she has just borne witness to state executions and torture, all these random acts of violence that keep a toll. And now she processes back to the tomb in the darkness of the early morning. In the movie version, in my mind, I see that her steps are heavy. I imagine the smells and sounds of those preceding days flood over her very being. She shudders. Her heart is beating so fast, even as everything around her is utterly silent. But it is a stillness she no longer trusts, an uneasy peace, and there she is, standing outside that horrible tomb alone, weeping. The other disciples have already left. They've gone back home. The patristic Gregory the Great said it was Mary's love for him that caused her to remain. There she is, grieving, shocked, confused. Not only at Christ's unexpected death, that's enough, but now all of a sudden the body is missing. It's the one thing she had to hold on to, to keep his memory, his words, his life, some small, tangible thing, anything to keep him alive. It's all gone. His tomb, a place to visit, made sacred not only by that physical body being there, it was supposed to be there, but by her love 
and those shreds of hope left over from what was but will seemingly never be again. It seems the old reality reigns supreme. We too, like Mary, have much to lament if we're being honest. Too many of us know how the old reality is marked by violence, death, and torture. We feel that despair with us. We carry it around everywhere we go. We have lived through a difficult year where it has looked like the light of the world has gone out. One war entered its third year with no end in sight, while in the fall we all became witnesses to daily horrors, images of violence and war in Israel and Gaza, slaughter exchanged for security. Two weeks ago, the EU's foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, said that Gaza has become the world's greatest open air graveyard. But we need not look far away for the violence. In 2023, we beheld over 565 mass shootings in every kind of town and community imaginable across our great nation. And this past week in a suburb of Moscow, 137 people were murdered at a concert venue in yet another act of terrorism. Their perpetrators horribly tortured, proudly displayed as a sign of even more barbarism and vengeance our old reality demands and perpetuates. And still there is so much violence that nobody will ever see. How many of us how many of you sitting in the pews carry an invisible wound, unseen, unspoken, in deceitful shame, we have come to believe that we bear our grief alone, that it is somehow our fault. It is all a bit too much. And so we, like Mary, find ourselves weeping. We are weeping. But take heart, because it turns out we're in very good company. This might be exactly the vantage point we need to see what comes next. Suddenly, and it's more mysterious than I can explain or even understand sometimes, suddenly everything changes. We can scarcely believe our eyes. The voice sounds so familiar, but we don't quite recognize it. The context is all wrong, like when you see somebody from church at the grocery store, but you don't recognize them. <laughs> we never expected to be in a place like this, did we? There is no real way to prepare for such a thing. Mary is having a conversation with him, friends. He is asking her questions. She looks at him to implore her cause, and finally he says her name, Mary. And the levy of her old reality breaks. Jesus is alive. She glimpses a new world through her tears. Hope floods in. This is Easter. It is not a promise that a few lilies, some fancy clothes, and a couple of songs can make you feel better or inspire you to live a better life. There is no depth to a gospel of self-help, my friends. I want you to see how frail that is this morning. Instead, Easter is the radical good news that new life comes after death, that there is another word spoken. There shall no longer be a final goodbye at the grave. God has acted in the world, and the old reality of death has been destroyed. It has been exposed as a profound lie. Jesus is alive and the Lord of all and new life and freedom are yours 
now. Eternity starts now. This is the foundation of our hope. Hope is grounded in this Easter story we tell about the end of an old way and the beginning of a new one. As Christians, the death of Jesus is how we come to regard our own deaths. Through faith, we not only see our life in his, but also our death in his. That's the promise of baptism. And it's this kind of hope that enables us to live into the new reality. Through hope, we can begin to see that death is not the end of our lives, that there is something much deeper to this new world. We know this kind of hope is real because beautiful things happen still every day. And in fact, God works in our lives in ways that cause these beautiful things to happen. They happen not despite our tears and sorrow, but in the midst of them. Through the tears, we, like Mary, can see Jesus standing in front of us, alive, calling us by name, declaring a future that is for us. We learn to live into a future that is larger, limitless, and that makes the brokenness of our present not only manageable, but even, dare I say, joyful at times. Now, I know that this hope of which I speak can be all a bit ethereal, so let me make it more tangible. Esau McCauley, he is a, a prominent up-and-coming black New Testament scholar. He wrote in the New York Times last year about why he is still a Christian despite the racism of the American Christian church. He said this, my mother recently purchased about an acre of land on the plantation where many of the black bones lived and died. She got it for around $500 because it was the slave burial site. Their bodies never finding rest on land owned by others now repose on land purchased by their descendants. We hold it in trust for them as their due. If the hope of Christians is true and there is indeed a resurrection of the dead, they will emerge from those graves as free people and their last moments on this side of new creation will be spent on their own soil. That is a hope worthy of my allegiance. That is the profound shock of Easter. That is the hope of which we tell. The old way is over. It's a lie. A new life awaits us and it flows first from that resurrected life of Jesus, you can trust in that. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.
We now come to the time of our offering. There are many ways to give to Pilgrim. There's a box in the back of the sanctuary. Um, you can go to our website. You can uh, do the Tithely app. Any of those ways is the, are ways that you can give to the church. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Dear loving Father, grant that our offering may show that we remember what may se many seem to forget. The real happiness does not come by acquiring and possessing, but by giving and serving. Please bless the gifts we have given. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join me in our doxology. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always, everywhere, to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, the only begotten one, before all time and by whom you made all things. And so we praise you, we join our voices with the angels and with the entire company of heaven who forever proclaim the glory of your name, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We bless you for your continual love and care for all creation. We praise you for forming us in your image and calling us to be your people. And although we rebelled against your love, you did not abandon us in our sin, but you sent prophets and teachers to lead us into the way of salvation. We rejoice in the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that, yes, the time had finally come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners like you and me. And by the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And when the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And so on that fateful night, that Monday, Thursday night, we remember that Jesus was at a table with his friends. And he took what he had, ordinary bread, and he gave thanks to God, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you gather in remembrance of me. And the supper went on, and towards the end of the meal, Jesus took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God and he said, take, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do so as often as you gather in remembrance of me. And so we do remember we remember these mighty acts in Jesus Christ. We offer ourselves as a holy, living sacrifice to God, even as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with one another, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at that heavenly banquet forever. And so now, with the confidence as Dearly beloved children of God, each and every one of us, let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us to, saying whichever words are most comfortable to us. There's one version printed in your bulletin. Feel free to say another. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Friends, I invite you to be what you see and to receive what you are. This is the body of Christ. Each and every one of you is a part of the body of Christ. At Pilgrim Congregational Church, we proudly celebrate an open communion table. That means it's open to everyone, everywhere, all, all people. If this is your first time in church in a long time and you're not really sure what you believe, you're welcome at this table. If you come here every Sunday and you know the liturgy better than I do, you're welcome at this table. If somebody that has looked or dressed like me has told you you don't belong, you're not good enough, you can't come forward, you are welcome at this table. All are welcome. Can I have uh, my deacons come forward to help me serve? Oh, and there are, forgive me, I forgot one part. There are gluten-free wafers here in the basket if you cannot partake of bread. Please come.
Good morning. Good morning. And happy Resurrection Day. On this special day, it has been our tradition to sing the Hallelujah Chorus to end the service. So immediately after the benediction, we invite you to join the choir, either in the loft or where you are sitting in the pew, standing in the pew, uh, to join us in singing this great song, Hallelujah Chorus, at that time. And let us now stand and sing our closing hymn, The Strife is Over. Friends, receive this benediction. The resurrected life is yours. Be a people of hope. Be a people of joy. Live to serve one another. Live in the love that God has for you. Go now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Mother and God of us all. Amen.